Hi, this is Karen Brown. Thanks for checking out the Mississippi Edition podcast. If you like what you hear, click subscribe, hit like, or leave us a comment if your app has that feature. Then find other MPB podcasts by searching MPB Think Radio on your favorite podcasting platform. Thanks. Good morning. It's 8.30 on Thursday, July 8th. I'm Karen Brown, and this is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, community health center visits skyrocket during the pandemic. Then, Mississippi is the only U.S. state without an equal pay law. And a conversation with writer Ace Atkins. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Despite the chaos of the COVID-19 pandemic, or perhaps because of it, visits to Mississippi's community health centers boomed last year. That's according to Allidade, a primary care management company contracted by the state to manage CHCs. They say that Medicaid patients, in particular, frequented community health care providers at a rate more than double that of the year prior. Evelyn Kaysen is director of Allidade in Mississippi. She tells MPB's Kobe Vance that community health Health centers are uniquely well equipped to meet the state's health care needs. Community health centers provide invaluable support and health access to Mississippians. They are community pillars. They provide care to not just um, Medicaid patients or uninsured, but commercially insured patients as well. And, you know, it was really important to help them continue to provide that care even during the pandemic, specifically with the Medicaid population. We continue to educate and proactively outreach to these patients, letting them know that care is available, that their primary care provider wants to provide care for them, educate them, especially during the pandemic. It was important for the primary care provider to be accessible, to answer questions, to help alleviate fears, as well as providing preventative care during the pandemic. So why do y'all think that we saw this uh, this much of an increase last year? Is it, is it um, I know you mentioned y'all obviously were sending out flyers and things to help raise awareness. Um, do you think there could have been other factors in play? I don't think it was by accident that we saw the increase. There were very targeted efforts to get patients into their primary care clinic. And, you know, the clinics are busy. They see thousands of patients every year. And to take the time to have a really um, targeted focus to outreach to patients, I think that had the big impact. I think that was the result we saw. And, and that's what we do. That's what we work to enable and encourage primary care to do is to proactively outreach to their patients to make sure that they are getting that care. In my conversations with doctors in the past, they've described Mississippi as very reactive when it comes to seeking medicine, as in not going to a doctor until something's gone wrong. But last year, it seemed like a lot of that was upturned in Mississippi as doctors couldn't see the same patients because coronavirus patients were filling up so much of ICUs. Do you think that that also contributed to the importance of primary care last year in, in the terms of trying to promote preventative medicine? Yeah, so I do think it posed a challenge for sure. Um, patients were fearful to come into the doctor's offices. Um, doctor's offices for a short time while they were figuring things out at the beginning might have been encouraging more tele- telemedicine visits. And, and thankfully, our state was adaptive and, and were allowing telemedicine access, which a lot of our health centers and clinics um, took a part of. But, you know, I think that's the, that's the difference. That's what we do here at Allidate is encourage preventative, proactive care, trying to move away from as much reactive medicine and trying to reach out to patients to try and keep them healthy, keep them at home, addressing problems before they become urgent situations where they need to be hospitalized during the emergency department. So that is what we do. That's what we're aiming to do is more prevention, more preventative care, and less reactive. Still being there and being accessible when those urgent situations arise, but really getting ahead of that stuff as frequently as we are able. In terms of this growth, uh, do you think this is sustainable? Can Mississippi could see continued growth into the next year? Oh, gosh, yes. That is what we are aiming to do. But, you know, patients, of course, need to understand the importance of preventative care. But the, the clinicians get it, right? Like they are reaching out to these patients proactively, 
trying to get ahead of of bad bad downstream events happening to patients. So yes, I believe it's sustainable. Yes, we are continuing outreach efforts now. Clinics are calling patients every day for proactive preventative screening visits. And and that's what we aim to do for all the patients in Mississippi that um, our practices are currently serving. Now, as far as this program, was this something that reacted to the pandemic specifically, or was this something that y'all had planned uh, for several for a while? No. So, you know, we started the work together um, on the contract in January of the year, and then the pandemic shortly followed. So um, it was a lot of flexing and flexibility to get prepared to respond to those needs, which our clinics were very quick to adapt to. Um, so I think that's what's so exciting about the story is that they were able to be successful and still encouraging preventative care, um, even when they were thrown this huge curveball. And now a lot of people, I was in talking with doctors in the past, they've also said that people have stayed home from doctor's yeah. appointments. Um, you know, kids aren't getting their shots and things like that because they have been scared because of the pandemic. But as we are starting to come out of that, uh, what do you think this next year could look like uh, for preventative medicine here in Mississippi, especially at community health centers? Yeah, we're really hopeful that not only will the success that we saw last year continue, but that will even rise further above that. We are gearing up for a back-to-school season that's right around the corner. A lot of the community health centers offer school-based health care to children. We did have some kids, of course, that fell behind on vaccines or preventative screenings. So we definitely want to get those back up um, and on track. But we're hopeful that this work continues. We have systems in place to continue to help support the clinics and the health centers. And we feel, we feel confident that the good progress and success we've had will continue in the upward trend. Is there anything else that stood out to you about you know, what we've seen over the past year that you, you either like Mississippians to know about or you just think is an interesting uh, aspect of seeing uh, this segment of uh, public health grow? Our community health centers, again, are there to serve all, all types of patients. And I think what's been really interesting about beginning to work with them and partner with them is they are really embracing this idea of value-based care. So um, not, not just for patients that are under contract necessarily, but patients, all patients, all patients, they're looking to incorporate well, well child visits, adult preventative medicine into all of their patient visits. And I, I've been really encouraged to see that growth and that understanding continue to expand in practice because Mississippians are going to improve because of that. We're getting better health care. Our health care system will be better set for success and improved um, results in the future. Evelyn Kaysen is director of Allidade, Mississippi. Coming up, Mississippi activists seek to close the gender pay gap. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law, host of In Legal Terms. If you're enjoying this podcast, I encourage you to listen to In Legal Terms, the show about you and your rights. We find interesting legal topics to bring to you and let you know how the law affects you. Find In Legal Terms on any podcasting platform on your smart device or on our website, inlegalterms.mpbonline.org. This is Mississippi Edition. I'm Karen Brown. In 2019, Alabama passed legislation to reinforce federal law banning pay discrimination based on race or gender. That left Mississippi as the only U.S. state without codified protections against unequal pay. Cassandra Welchlin is executive director of the Mississippi Black Women's Roundtable. She says black women at the intersection of multiple marginalized identities are especially likely to face discriminatory pay practices. Every black woman should be able to take care of her family without having to worry about, you know, what will my kids eat or how will I pay my bills? And right now, you know, in the state of Mississippi, black women are really making so much less on the dollar compared to a white male. And and what comes with that is also less stress and less worry, which we know that black women carry a lot of and we have higher 
you know, a lot of comorbidities that exist within our communities. And a lot of that has to do with stress. And if you can eliminate those financial income insecurities, then you have a whole healthy woman that's able to live a longer life so that she can take care of her families and and just be a whole woman. But it's the financial security that we are really after here. And in the state of Mississippi, she's not getting that. Talk to me about what the gender wage gap looks like in Mississippi between a black woman and, and say, a white male. So right now, a black woman is making 56 cents on the dollar compared to for every dollar a white male is paid, a white non-Hispanic male is paid. I mean, that is a lot, a lot less. So 56 cents on the dollar, that means that the typical black woman starting at age 20 working would have to work until the age of 91 to catch up to the white non-Hispanic man's career earnings by age 60. So she is working almost 30 years longer than what that white male would work at his retirement to, to really make that up. That's wage theft. That seems really, for us, not only is it wage theft, but that's immoral to me as well. So she is losing $849,000 in wages over the course of her 40-year career. That's wage theft. And, you know, Black Women's Equal Pay Day is coming up in August, August 3rd. So what that means is that where the white male has made this, his wages in December, a black woman has to work almost eight months in order to make up those wages. And so that is a significant, significant gap. And not only that, you know, when we talk about what black women are not getting paid, Uh, We're also talking about what could those resources have done for her family and her community because equal pay and pay equity is just not about, you know, a woman's issue. It's a family issue. It's a community issue. And it's also a state issue because, you know, we're talking about the local economy. and And we know that, you know, women and black women have a lot of buying power. And we spend those dollars back into the community. And so when she doesn't get what she needs, the rest of her cents for that dollar, then the state is losing and also the community is losing. Just to piggyback up on the state, right? So what laws are on the books in terms of like equal pay protection and how does Mississippi compare nationally? Currently, Mississippi does not have an equal pay law, and our organization, through our Mississippi Women's Economic Security Initiative, has been working um, over the last probably seven years to advocate for equal pay law. We have a federal law that is to prohibit pay discrimination against women. However, the courts have opened significant loopholes in those laws that really allow employers to discriminate based on race and sex. And we know those things correlate um, significantly. So Mississippi is the only state in the country without an equal pay law. Not only that, we have the widest wage gap in the country than anywhere else. And the, the other part of this is Women do not have the resources to go to court, right? Women don't want to go to court. We just want to get the wages that is due us. But the state of Mississippi has not prioritized that. And it's interesting because every year when we bring this before the legislature and um, and, our, and some of our colleagues, you know, have introduced this legislation, we usually get that, well, this doesn't seem like a real priority, We've heard that. We also have heard, well, I haven't heard a lot of people talking about it. And the other thing is, oh, we got so many other things that's more important, like health care or the criminal justice system and all of those things. Well, it all correlates. For us, we don't look at this as just one siloed issue. 
if a woman can't pay her bills, suppose she got a court ticket or something and she couldn't, and she may get locked up for not paying a fine, but if she had had her pay, uh, equitable pay, she could have used those dollars to pay her fine so she wouldn't have to go to jail. Let's talk about health care. If she had the resources based on her pay and that was equitable, she'll be able to get the medication that she needs. And so it is all intersectional. And so it's so important that the state of Mississippi takes this serious. And it takes it serious because You know, when we look at who's in the workforce in Mississippi, half of them are women. Women are in the workforce in Mississippi, but yet, you know, we're two-thirds of the minimum wage earners in Mississippi. And so it is just so key and important that Mississippians take us seriously and take our pay seriously. If Mississippi would pass an equal pay law in the state of Mississippi, it would cut the poverty rate in half and will contribute $4.15 $4.15 billion back into the economy if we will pass that equal pay law. And that's significant. Tammy Witherspoon shares many of Welchland's frustrations. Witherspoon is mayor of Magnolia, Mississippi, and a former state senator who perennially championed equal pay legislation. When I was presenting the bill, you know, I'm like, you have a mother, you have a daughter, you know, you have a sister, you have aunts and stuff. You know, why wouldn't that have been important to all legislators? I do know in the year 2020, the year uh, where we had the 100 years, when it was 100 years of suffrage, of this women's suffrage, that was the year that we came real close to. You know, we did give bipartisan support with the women but in, in both chambers, the Republican and Democrat women in the House chamber and Democrat and Republican women in the Senate chamber. We came together, and we knew that that year was very important to us. It marked 100 years, so we wanted to come up with a bill that both parties can support, you know, and that both parties can, um, you know, we could bring down as a comedian. We could get it on the floor, and we could discuss it and talk about it and and hopefully pass. But, of course, you know, um, corona hit. And, um, you know, we were not successful in in that area, unfortunately. Some prominent state officials continue to support equal pay legislation, notable among them Attorney General Lynn Fitch, who is outspoken on the issue. Coming up, Mississippi Identity informs the writing of Oxford's Ace Atkins. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. A contractor ever tell you the price of something and it sounds so high you think, eh, maybe I'll try it myself. Some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. This is Mississippi Edition. I'm Karen Brown. Oxford writer Ace Atkins is a model of efficiency. His prose is tight and taut and precise. Over the course of his career, he's produced some 28 novels. His latest, The Heathens, is the 11th installment of a series centered around small-town sheriff Quinn Colson. Colson is, in his own way, an efficient man. He's capable. He's a capable crime solver armed with a discernment and discipline that, as Atkins tells us, belie a checkered past. He wasn't always a stand-up guy and doing the right thing. He was a kid that had kind of a tumultuous beginning. And as a teen, that's what led him to going into the Army. It was a, it was either going to juvie or going to Army and uh, going to the Army. And he ended up getting straight and coming home and becoming sheriff. I realize not everyone knows who Quinn Colson is. This is the 11th book. Maybe you better tell our listeners who he is and why he is the lead character in all of these books. I wanted to create something that that really spoke to this region. You know, there are different heroic characters that are in different parts of the country and very well-known figures. You've got uh, Raymond Chandler famously wrote about Philip Marlowe in L.A. and there's a great writer in Wyoming named C.J. Box who writes a a character named Joe Pickett. And they're they're very true to those areas. And so really what I wanted to do with Quinn Colson is create somebody who would be a great hero for Mississippi. So he's a a former Army Ranger. He's come home. And and really what the whole series is about is him trying to make a difference in his own backyard. And he runs for sheriff. And so this series is really about how he's made an impact in his own community. You set all of these books in a fictional county in Mississippi. 
Tibaw County, I want it's a it's a very real place, and I think it's got to be a very real place for my readers. But it's a what I'd, I would call a fairly typical uh, northeast Mississippi county, and it's really made up of several different places. A lot of Calhoun County there, a lot of Yalabusha County in there, a little Marshall County. But it really illustrates, I think, some of the the issues and both the good, the bad, and the ugly of what it's like here in North Mississippi. And tell us too about Lily Virgil because she plays a big role in these books. Lily Virgil is is one of my favorite characters, and I think for readers, uh, she is really one of theirs, too. They, they really like it when she has a prominent role, and she's a character that we first met who had been a, a deputy sheriff working alongside Quinn in the early books, and as the books progressed, she became a U.S. Marshal. And in this story, which is about a group of teens that are on the run but have been accused of really heinous murder, she has been tasked with tracking them down. And the chase goes everywhere from Memphis to Hot Springs, Arkansas, down in Louisiana, and she's on the trail of them. And I think for this book, it really gave Lily a chance to shine even more because she's in a role that's that's apart from Quinn. She and Quinn are at odds over these kids. Is Quinn's opinion or, or thoughts shaped by the fact that he was a sort of a juvenile delinquent himself when he was a teen? I think so. I think that we get back to who Quinn was before he came into adulthood and got his life straightened out. But I saw here, and, and we see this frequently in North Mississippi, I've been very fortunate to uh, get to know people that work in law enforcement here, both with Lafayette County and, and Calhoun County. And you see so many kids who are left on their own to take care of themselves, to fend for themselves, and, and uh, they don't always get the best representation. And I think that what Quinn's trying to do in this book is make sure that she gets a fair shake and that she's really being heard. And that's really what the whole book is about. I mean, 17-year-old girl who's been essentially tasked with not only taking care of herself for a long while, but also really being a mother to her younger brother is really all too common here in Mississippi. So yes, yeah, certainly Quinn sees, you know, he's been blamed for things that he didn't do. And he knows what it's like to not be heard. And I think that's certainly something that he wants to, to do for TJ. This book is loosely based on a story you covered as a journalist, three teenagers involved in a murder of the girl's mother and very gruesome. First of all, horrible to kill her mother, but uh, horrible in the way that it happened. So you've been hanging on to this and has it been in the back of your mind? I, I think I just couldn't shake that story. It's, it's one of the darkest stories that I covered as a, as a newspaper reporter on the crime beat in Florida. It's not necessarily something that I wanted to visit right off. I was looking for the right time to tell the story. And this is not that story. This is really just very, very loosely inspired by what happened. And in that case, it sets off very similar with TJ's case, which is a woman is murdered. Very quickly, her daughter is being blamed for the murder. It's a very heinous killing. The woman is basically dismembered, left in a trash barrel with bleach, trying to dispose of evidence, and kids go on the run. And very quickly, as a journalist covering the case that I covered in Florida, this, this 14-year-old girl, uh, Vanessa Robinson, it was known that she was guilty. And there really wasn't a lot of questions whether she and her two male associates you know, had actually committed this crime. But in the story of T.J. Bird, my whole catalyst for this is what if those kids had been innocent? And what if they had been set up? And what if they were having to be forced on the run without actually being able to voice their own story? And things, of course, have changed a lot as this case happened 22 years ago. Now we have social media, and the, the chance of kids on the run getting their story out is very different than it was 22 years ago. And I think now is a very different kind of tale because you can use social media to make your case. And as these kids are, are on the run and as they're trying to make their way through Hot Springs and down Louisiana, they're also pleading their case on social media. And I think that makes it a very, very timely story as well. The book is called The Heathens. The author is Ace Atkins. Ace, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, Karen. Always a pleasure. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Edition podcast from MPB News and MPB Think Radio. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. And if your app lets you, leave a comment or review. We really do appreciate it. Remember, you can always get in touch with MPB News on Facebook and Twitter. And fresh episodes of the podcast are posted every weekday morning. I'm Karen Brown. Thanks for listening. This is Mississippi Edition from MPB Think Radio.